Picks, I'd like to introduce Casper uh, Hare. He is professor of the MIT Department of Linguistics and Philosophy, uh, and he will speak about gender AI ethics. Uh, hello. Do you mind if I pace? I think I'll pace. Um, <laughs> hi. AI ethics. So this is a big thing. Um, I, I thought I'd narrow it down a little bit here. So, ooh. Maybe I need to be here. Apparently, I can't pace. Um, <laughs> I'm going to talk about agential AI. So there's been a, a great deal of um, talk recently about um, making generative AI that is in the terms agential, or this seems to be the term that's winning out at the moment, agentic. I find agentic less grammatical than agential, but that's how it goes. OK, so what do they mean? We mean AI that exercises agency, the way that we exercise agency. So rather than just uh, generating code and text and images, this, AI, this is AI that will do, some, do things in something like the way that we do things. So that by making decisions and plans and acting on those decisions and plans. So how would that be? Suppose it got really perfect. What would it look like? Um, that's the first question. So what would it be for an AI to exercise agency the way that we exercise agency? And the second question I want to talk about here is how do we ensure that these new agents, they work with us rather than against us. And so as a philosopher, I'd like to offer some observations about these big and rather pressing questions. OK, so first, exercising agency the way that we do. So when you or I are in a position to make a decision and do something, here's a kind of model of how it would go in the ideal case. First, you identify your options. So there's a whole bunch of things you can do, right? There's like almost infinitely many things you can do. You partition that space of things you can do into a manageable set of options. I can do this or that or the other thing. Three options, say. Then you evaluate those options, the options you've identified, using your beliefs and your desires. Your beliefs tell you what's likely to happen if I take this option, what's likely to happen if I take that, so that option. And your desires tell you, how desirable is it then that I take this option, and how desirable is it that I take that option? And ideally, these beliefs and desires are based on evidence in the case of beliefs. They're not just random beliefs you have. They're beliefs that you ought to have in light of evidence and reasons in the case of desires. So there, you want things that you should want. Then, having evaluated the options, you make a decision to go with the best option the decision yields an intention, I will do this, and then, sometime later, you do it. Of course, that's not how it, like, always goes, but that's how it might go ideally. There's a canonic expression of agency in action. OK, um, can we get an AI to do this? I mean, the existing so-called agentic uh, generative AIs are very, very far away from being able to do pretty much any of this. Particularly, the general project of identifying options is not on the table at the moment. Even having beliefs, um, although you're familiar with generative AI that says all kinds of things, it's really not obvious that it has beliefs. Having beliefs involves um, there being a kind of stability and consistency in what you say, and it's not at all obvious that present generative AIs have that kind of consistency. Um, but uh, supposing it all could, supposing that we have AI that can identify options, that has beliefs, and supposing we can give it desires. Um, what sorts of desires do we want to give it? Um, well, this, this is, um, uh, there's a sort of famous story that's uh, based around this problem, this question of what desires we want to give the AI. It's the story of the paperclip generating AI. We make an AI. We want to, it to uh, construct paper, paper, paper clips. We give it the goal of making paper clips as efficiently as possible. And it turns out that because the AI only values the making of paper clips, it ends up destroying us all. Um, the problem there with that AI is that we gave it the final goal of making paper clips. 
whereas we only instrumentally value pa pa making paperclips. We value pa making paperclips because we really value other things, and we think generally having paperclips enables us to, to get the other things that we value. Um, so the moral that's been taken from that is that the kinds of desires that we should give these AI should line up not with our sort of narrow, short-term instrumental goals, but with our final goals, what we really want. And then that, that brings up the question is, what is it that we really want? This is known as the alignment problem. And there's a view that's out there. It's very, very out there at the moment um, that goes something like this. Here's how we get an AI whose final goals align with ours. People have welfare. Um, welfare comes in qualities and quantities. One person may have more of it than another. So if you're better off than me, that's because your life is better than my life. And that's because there's more welfare, there's more of the welfare stuff in your life than there is in my life. Um, an agential AI with desires aligned with our interests should try to maximize total welfare, the total amount of welfare over the course of world history, whether it's had by people or by animals or whoever possesses welfare. And when the AI is uncertain about what will maximize total welfare, the AI should try to maximize expected total welfare. So you don't know exactly what's going to maximize total welfare, maximize the expectation of it. This is a view um, that really corresponds to AIs being told to act in accordance with what's called total utilitarianism, a view that goes back to Jeremy Bentham, uh, John Stuart Mill. It's had a long history in philosophy. Um, to tell something about history, I'd say that by the 1990s, at least, when I started doing philosophy, this view had fallen into, it was kind of a sideshow. <laughs> um, there was, there was uh, people taught it in classes, but I wouldn't say it was a mainstream view in ethics. Um, there's a joke about this. Uh, so a psychopath, this is the clean version of the joke. Um, a psychopath and a total utilitarian are sitting on a park bench. And the psychopath says, if you kill your mother, then I will cause a brief wave of pleasure to sweep across a shed load of rabbits. And the total util utilitarian replies, how big is the shed? Anyway, that's a philosophy joke. Had us in hysterics, I tell you, um, <laughs> back then. OK, um, so this was not taken, I would say, very, very seriously by philosophers back then. Um, nowadays, it's taken very seriously indeed, in part because a bunch of philosophers in the 2000s decided that it was true and decided that they should try to convert influential people in the tech industry into uh, maximizing total welfare and founded a movement, the effective altruist movement that I, th I think you know about. Um, and yeah, it was all about um, utilitarianism in, in action. Um, what's the problem with this? Uh, the problem with this is that when you look at prospects and decide what maximizes expected total welfare, Look at, say, prospect one, 100% chance of generating one unit of, of welfare. Compare it to prospect two, a 99% chance of generating two units of welfare. Surely two is better than one. I mean, it's slightly less likely to happen. You get twice as much welfare. By similar reasoning, three has got to be better than two. 98% chance of generating four, four units of welfare. I mean, it's slightly less of a chance, but you get, again, twice as much welfare. And in this list, which I haven't included, four is better than three, and so on and so, so forth, until we get to prospect 100, which is a 1% chance of generating two to the 99 units of welfare. And um, it seems like 100 has got to be better than 99. So by the transitivity of better than, 100 has got to be better than one. And what does that tell us? That tells us that we've got to take tiny chances of maximizing, you know, of, of generating enormous amounts of welfare over certainly doing good right now. So in practice, that means uh, given a chance between certainly helping a billion people right now or reducing the chances that sometime in the next century an asteroid wipes out human life, from 0.1% to 0.05%, you've got to go with prospect B. It means that uh, given a, a choice between certainly helping a billion people right now or raising our chances of colonizing other star systems before the sun engulfs the Earth, from 0.1% to 0.2%, you've got to go with raising the chances of colonizing other star systems. So this is all just a natural uh, outgrowth of the uh, total utilitarian view. So if we give our AIs um, these kinds of final desires, these are the kinds of priorities that they're going to have. What's the alternative? 
I'm, of course, presenting this in a quite prejudicial way. I, I take it you. <laughs> what is the alternative that I'm pushing here? Um, well, we recognize that there are many incommensurable, incommensurable dimensions of well being. It may be that you're better off than me in one way, I'm better off than you in another way, but there's no fact of the matter as to who is better off overall, nor can you put numbers and associate numbers with our lives that represent precisely how well off we are. It may be that your life could be improved in a certain way, and yet your life as a result is better, but it's still neither better nor worse than my life. And uh, that means, yeah, for some ways of being better or worse off, there's no measuring or quantifying how well off we are in those ways. And the difficulty associated with this, which is a view that aligns with how we think about our interests, is that it's much harder to program into a computer. But we need to try if we're not going to be dealing with AIs that are obsessed with colonizing other solar systems. So, thank you. <laughs>